quickening of the Holy Ghost or when we call upon the name of Jesus because see soon as Jesus came on the scene immediately the de demonic had to come and bow down to the name of Jesus amen y'all with me church so I'm telling you if 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 when we call upon the name of Jesus and if the Holy Spirit is quickening you well I'm not a bad person I don't do bad things and that's cool but if the Holy Spirit is quickening you this morning I'm saying you need to come and just let the Lord bless you this morning amen church I'm not trying to prop I'm not trying to prod I'm not trying to do any of those things I'm just saying if the Holy Spirit is dealing with you this morning then he's dealing with us for a specific reason amen there's something that he's trying to get to you this morning amen or there's something that he would like to do within your heart this morning but don't leave here deceived and don't leave here bound thinking that you're free but in actuality you're bound amen church amen church come on now amen just just a thought just a Holy Ghost thought As we continue to pray for people, and if you need any prayer, come up. The altar's open. Uh, I would just like to continue on with the service and say happy Mother's Day to each of the mothers here. Where would we be without our mothers, right? As you see, Pastor Bob's not here. Uh, he ended up with a cough and uh, so he decided to stay home but it's it's better to have coughing in you than for you to be in a coffin right <laughs> so <laughs> it's just something that's wanting to get out I'm talking about the coffin now I'm not talking about me <laughs> we uh, The, the spirit is rich in here today, in here today. <laughs> TBN has a, a movie coming out, what, C, CBN, yeah, CBN, Trinity, Trinity Broadcasting, Christian Broadcasting, all, all of those, not, not Turner, well, I'm not talking about Turner, I'm talking about... But uh, it's, it's going to be one day only. And it's going to be Tuesday, May 23rd. And uh, it, what it's talking about, what the movie is about, is about 50 years ago, June of 1967, when Israel took back the Temple Mount, took back the city of Jerusalem. And uh, we have a little trailer we're going to show. And... Uh, it's, it's showing in, in uh, several different places, but the closest place here is, uh, what is that, Royal, the Royal Cinema? Regal. Regal, yeah, I knew it had something to do with that. Yeah, on Mall Drive. So, uh, Rick, if you'll show that, uh, that trailer. The name of it is In Our Hands, and you can go online and get, get tickets, and uh, it's really quite an adventure. You, 
you got anything you want to share on that line? The time has come to begin a battle of annihilation. Israel of the map. We shall destroy Israel and its inhabitants. I just started this job ten months ago. Now you want me to plan an entire war in two days? Yes. You know, it's amazing every time the countries that surround Israel attack Israel, the outcome is Israel gains more, more land. And you know, that's a lesson for us. Every time the enemy attacks us, we should gain more land from him. I was, I was looking at that movie, uh, God's Not Dead, Friday night, and this pastor kept, uh, an evangelist friend of his came to town, and he wanted to go to, he wanted to, go to Florida, to, to Disneyland, Disney World, whatever it is, and uh, his car wouldn't start. And the next day, they, they got a rental car, and it wouldn't start. And things kept happening, and the car wouldn't start. But... And then they finally got a car that would start, and they were leaving town, and there was this big mob of, of Christians there going to see a concert. And the guy says, now I'm being held up by Christians. And it started to rain, and this guy got hit by a vehicle, the professor. And this was the timing of the Lord, and I, I just love the timing of the Lord. That, Christ, that, that pastor wasn't supposed to be down in Florida, he was supposed to be right there where that guy needed to be led back to the Lord. And sometimes when things don't work out for you, it's because God wants you in a particular place at a particular time. The time has come. Please, Please do not, do not try, try to request to accept. <laughs> All right. Remember how we did that. I might want to use that later on. <laughs> I'm getting happy now. Yes. Well, Depends on what I just said. <laughs> well, it's going to go back and forth while they figure all that out. But I heard a missionary one time who said that, um, you know, you know, missionaries struggle whenever they go from place to place to place. They don't always get all the money they need to go and do what they need to do. And, and I remember him talking about the fact that he had this old broken down vehicle and it had four bald tires on it. And those tires had the, he, you know, he had the money to replace the tires. And uh, ironically, what happened was he had to go preach at a revival and, um, the, the tire ended up going flat, so he had a, a tire pump, and he, he pumped the tire up, and, and he says, okay, God, you got to keep these tires going for me. Well, he was able to go to this two-day revival. He went to another revival, and when he pulled back into his driveway, all the tires went, Phew. Every single one of the tires went flat. But God, the, the story behind that is God kept those bald tires intact for him to be able to go and minister to all those people. And he was driving to a couple of different states. And as soon as he got back home and was done with his work, the tires went 
all of them went flat, you know, and of course God provided the money for him to get them fixed. But the moral of the story is, is if God has a place that he wants you to go, right. your car's going to start. Your tires are going to stay filled, and even whenever the, the, the I was going to say the doctor, the mechanic looks at it and goes, I don't understand how your car is going. Say, I've got the true mechanic who can make anything happen, you know, and it's the same thing with the doctors. I don't listen to what the doctors say because I've got a Dr. Jesus who can heal all of our pains. So we need to know that God will even make our cars run when there is no gas. And I'm sure, I don't know about anybody else, but I've prayed my way to the gas station many times. God, I'm on fumes, and I know you can get me there, and I have rolled into the gas station right up to the pump, and the car shut off, and I'm like, you know what, God, thank you. I didn't even have to push it an inch. We made it. So thank God for even the most minute things, because God is our Father, and he looks out for us in everything that we do. Thank you. And, and I can personally testify this bald head hadn't gone flat yet, so God still has somewhere for me to be. <laughs> okay, uh, Willie, you want to come on down? And we, uh, we have a, a very special guest today. Willie Preston's going to bring the word. And <laughs> Willie, get on up here, sugar bear. <laughs> That's my sugar bear there. I'm telling you now. Woo! Come here, give me a hug. And, and if we have any testimonies after Willie gets through, we'll... we'll uh... I've been sidestepping this for quite, quite some time now. And like Will said once, you got to do what the Lord wants you to do. So I have a message today. And the people that's going to see this on this DVD, it might not sit well with them. And it might not sit well with some of you guys. Because I'm going to say some things that need to be said. And, uh, but I'm going to tear a page out of Willie's book. Don't anybody in here pick up any condemnation because it ain't about that. It's about the truth. I'm going to talk about marriage. That's my message today is marriage. This is for anybody that's already married or anybody who plan on getting married. Again, no condemnation. I don't know what's going on in your life. No condemnation. If you've been divorced, so what? I've been divorced. So no condemnation here. I find that there are two definitions for marriage. The world's definition, and then there's God's definition. Now, we're going to start with the world's definition. Why are you starting with the world's definition? Why don't you start with God's definition? Well, the natural, then the spiritual. Because God's definition is going to blow the world's definition out of water. Okay? So, the, uh, in 2015, our Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage. Okay? And just across the pond, the Queen of England, they brought a law in called the Marriage Bill, which also legalized same-sex marriage. Now, around the world, there's about 15 nations that has brought this to the forefront, same-sex marriage. So, obviously, the social definition for marriage is going down the tubes. So, just speaking for myself, I don't know how you guys feel, but I don't think our government or any government 
has the right to redefine marriage. I say this because marriage has already been defined by the most high authority, which is God Almighty. You hear people talking about getting sex changes just so they can marry somebody that they want to get married to. Let me tell you something. Ain't no such thing as a sex change in the first place. Now, you can move some stuff around. You know, but when it comes down to it, if you born a woman, you're going to die a woman. If you born a man, you're going to die a man. And don't you think for one minute that God didn't know that man was going to try to do this? God knows everything. He knew that. That's why he fixed it. Well, you can't do it. Amen. So ain't no such thing as a sex chain. That's right. Now that's the world's definition. Let's talk about God's definition. The first principle was in Genesis. Chapter 2, verse 18. And this is what the Lord said. It is not good. It is not beneficial. For the man to be alone. I will make him a help, one who balances him, a counterpart who is suitable and complementary for him. Now, when God said this, all the animals were there. They were right there. But God couldn't find no animal suitable enough for Adam. <laughs> so, so God in a special act of creation he put Adam to sleep and he took one of his ribs and he created a woman and a few verses down from that you see where he called that woman his wife so the first marriage was ordained by God in the garden of Eden okay now, Adam said in verse 23, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So the author of Genesis goes on to record uh, the future standards by which a marriage is defined in verse 24. And here's what it says. A man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. One flesh. We're going to get into that. This passage is, is, uh, points out several things uh, for God's understanding in the design of marriage. First, marriage involves two people. <laughs> one man. And one woman. Amen. Two people. There is not a passage in scripture. Anywhere else in the Bible. That says anything different. Nowhere. You can't find it. You can start in Genesis and go to Revelation. And if you can read backwards. You can start in Revelation and go back to Genesis. And you won't find it. It's one man and one woman. First of all, it's impossible for human reproduction to come about sexually. Because God ordained sex in a marriage, but only in a marriage. That's for the husband and the wife, only in a marriage. But you can't have children if you're not a man and a woman when you come together. That's called the family unit. That's why God did what he did. That's why he fixed it that way. I got to say that again. 
God ordained sex between a husband and a wife. That's the only way that we can reproduce. Anything else is just anything else. Now the second principle about God's desire for marriage is that marriage is intended to last a lifetime. It's intended to last a light lifetime. Don't pick up no condemnation if you've been divorced. Like I said, I've been divorced. But see, God sent me somebody that death did us part. Okay? But he sent me somebody that I could love and that loved me back. And he sent me somebody that was of him. Of him. We're going to get into that too, sister. <laughs> so, Eve was taken from Adam's side and they became literally, literally one flesh. They became one flesh. Eve's very substance came from Adam. It didn't come from the ground. It came from Adam. Her very substance came from Adam through God. In every marriage after Adam and Eve is supposed to be shared in that same unity that they had. Every marriage from that day to this day. Because their bond was in the flesh. They were together forever until they went on to see the Lord. And when Adam and Eve got married, now catch this, there was no escape clause to get out, come on son, to get out of it. There was no escape clause. See God, cause God, they was gonna meant to live forever. Therefore, if you're going to live forever and you got a wife and a husband, you're going to stay married forever. Ain't no different today. No different today. There's people in here that's married. And I can tell they're going to stay married forever until death do them part. That couple right there. <laughs> Pastor Bob and Miss Susan. Until death do them part. Frank and Linda. A lot of y'all in here. Just about it, well, I would say everybody in here that's married, I think are going to be, be together until death, do, if you keep coming here. That's right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and when a man and a woman make a commitment to get married, they become one flesh when they get married. Until death do us part. It's just like, I thought about this. I said, okay, when I lived in Chicago for a brief while, for a few years, they had gangs, okay? Now, if you was in one of those gangs, you was committed to that gang. You was committed to that gang. And the only way to get out of that gang, you had to die out. You, you couldn't quit. You had to die out. Same thing with marriage. The only way you're supposed to get out of a marriage is die out. You, like we'll say, am I keeping it real? If my wife hadn't gone on to be with the Lord, we'd still be married for another 30 something years. You know? You have to die out of a marriage. You don't quit a marriage because when you get married, it's serious. Ain't no more boyfriend, girlfriend. Uh uh. Throw that out the window. You're married now. It's more serious than that. It's forever until you, well not forever, but until you leave this earth. 
Marriage is serious until death we do part. A third principle from that passage about God's design for marriage is monogamy, which that means being married to one person at a time. You know, even though they're in scripture now, there were some people that had more than one wife. You know, but from the creation account, that's not how God designed it. He didn't design it that way. Well, you know, men, we take on a whole different animal because we think we're in charge. But the Lord is in charge. We ain't in charge of nothing. We ain't in charge of ourselves. We, we ain't in charge of nothing. Everything belongs to the Lord, even us. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus emphasized this principle when he appealed to the Genesis account about an idea of an easy divorce. You remember when the Pharisees was, was uh, trying to test Jesus and they came up to him and asked him, was it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Put up, Rick, uh, Matthew 19, 3 through 6, please. This is what Jesus said. Have you ever read that he, talking about God, who created them from the beginning, made them male and female, and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined inseparably to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. That tells me right there, let no one separate, that this is supposed to be for life. We got to get that in our head. This is for life. When you make that commitment, or you're already in that commitment, it's for life. It ain't till you get, it ain't like a car. You drive it, well, I'll get a new car next year. It ain't like that. It's for life. So, we know what can mess a marriage up. How do we make our marriages last? Well, I remember Pastor Bob was saying the, for, uh, the, the most, the first of all, the most important issue is to be obedient to God and his word in a marriage. You have to be obedient to God. And that obedience it's supposed to start way before the marriage starts. When you just dating and contemplating on getting married, that obedience to God is supposed to start right then and there. First of all, you should be a believer and she should be a believer. That's the first thing. The scripture says this, do, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Now, for that born again believer, that means that a close relationship with anyone who is not a believer, you shouldn't have it in a marriage. The Bible says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. So if you got a believing woman and she wants to get with this believe, unbelieving man and you do it, you're going against the word of God. The Bible says, what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? 
If she's righteous and you wicked, y'all ain't got nothing in common. Yeah. Only thing y'all got in common is the hots for each other. That's about it. <laughs> and the Bible also says, what fellowship can light have with darkness? If he in the light and you in the dark, you can't have no fellowship. Ain't nothing going to work out right. Nothing. You both got to be in the light. And if we followed these principles before we got married, we wouldn't have to go through the sufferings later on in the marriage. If we put these principles first, And this is not only just with our marriages, it's with some of our close friendships. I have two real good friends that I was in the Navy with. And uh, we don't spend a whole lot of time together because when we was in the Navy, they still doing some of those same things that we shouldn't have been doing when we was in the Navy. So you have to cut your ties with certain people. Amen. You know, you have to cut your ties with certain people. Amen. The Lord told Noah, he said, take a male and his mate of that kind and put them on the ark. The Lord is telling us the same thing today in marriage. Take a mate of that kind, I'm talking about believer, and put her in the ark or him in the ark. It ain't no different. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Another principle that will protect the longevity of our marriages is that the husband obey God and love, honor, and protect his wife as he would his own body. Rick, put up Ephesians 5, 25 through 31, please. Husbands, love your wives. Seek the highest good for her and surround her with a caring, unselfish love. Just as Christ so loved the church and gave himself up for her. So that he might sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water and with the word of God. So that in turn, he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor. Without spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she would be holy, set apart for God, and blameless. Even so, husbands should and are normally obli morally obligated, morally obligated to love their own wives as being a sense of their own bodies. And we're going to stop right there. As being a sense of their own bodies. When Eve taken from Adam, so you got to love that woman just like you love your body. You love your body because you get in the mirror and you shave and you go to the gym and you build the muscles up. You get out there and you run and everything like that. You love your body. You pamper that little body. <laughs> but you got to love that woman the same way as you love your body. He who loves his own wife loves himself because she's a part of you you got to love her if you love yourself and vice versa that's how it works for no one ever hated his own body but instead he nourishes and protects and cherishes it all that what i just said just as christ does the church because we are members parts of his body we all are. For this reason, here we go again, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined 
and be faithfully devoted to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Let's talk a little bit more about that one flesh. Because I think sometimes we fail to realize uh, what it means. You know, if I'm not mistaken, I think Michelle talked about this once. The term one flesh means that our bodies are one whole entity that cannot be divided into pieces and still be a whole. So God intended it to be with a marriage relationship. There are no longer two entities, but now one entity, which is we call the married couple, one entity. Okay, so you, somebody might say, well, I'm one with my spouse, but what about my emotional attachments to my mom? Okay, well, a lot of marriage partners place a whole lot of emotion on their attachment with their mom, their dad, or even their children. But let me tell you, and God made this very clear, if you put your mom before your husband, or you put your mom before your wife, that's a recipe for disaster right there. That's a recipe for disaster. Because that goes against God's intention on leaving and cleaving. Okay? Now, the Bible says that a man is supposed to cleave to his wife. You know what that means? You're supposed to be stuck to that woman like glue. That's what that means. You cleave to that woman. You know what I'm saying? Because when you get married, that marriage takes precedence over any other relationship. That includes your children. That includes your mama. That includes your daddy. That includes your relative. That includes everybody but the Lord. That's why it says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You can't stress that enough. Matter of fact, let me read that again. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. I asked my cousin, uh, whom I love dearly, in uh, we was just sitting talking. This is the last time I was down in Arkansas. And uh, when I went to my, my aunt, which had just turned 101, went to her funeral. Anyway, I asked my cousin. We were talking, talking about the Lord and everything. And I asked her, you know, when it came to your husband and your mom, who comes first? And she told me I wouldn't put anybody before my mother. I said, well, baby, I love you. I said, but that ain't the way it's supposed to work. And I need to give you a little correction. Yes. And, you know, and we can talk like that because we love each other. We grew up with each other, you know. And, uh, and I told her, you don't put nobody before your husband. Just like he don't put nobody before you. Leaving and cleaving. And if the Lord wants that man to stick to that woman like glue, he wants that woman to stick to that man like glue too. Because you are one. No more two. Ain't no more Rachel and, and Charles. It's one. Now we see them as Rachel and Charles. But when they with each other, they one. That's probably times when she can think of something and he's probably thinking of the same thing. You know what I'm saying? That's the way it is. And let me tell you something, guys and women. You can find some practical ways to make your marriage last. You know, like, you can spend some quality time with each other. 
That helps a lot. You can uh, say, I love you. Bye. Baby, you know I love you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can be kind to her. Uh, she can be kind to you, you know? You got to show each other affection. You know, you, you offer each other compliments. Girl, you know, you sure look good in PJs. You know, you know, you know, you, 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 <laughs> you go, you go out on dates, you know, write little notes, write little notes. Baby, you know, I love you more today than I did yesterday. You know, give her gifts. My wife loved that part. <laughs> but most importantly, above all, be ready to forgive. Be ready to forgive. Because all those things that I just said are all encompassed in that Bible. It's all there. God don't say it the way I say it, but it's there. He wants us to do all those things for each other. And when God brought Eve to Adam in the first marriage, she was made from his flesh and bone, and they became one flesh. And becoming one flesh, it means more than just a physical union. It means a meeting of the minds, a meeting of the spirit, meeting of the soul. That's how you become one. That's how you become one unit. And that relationship, it goes way beyond uh, uh, emotional attraction. It goes way beyond that. You know, it goes into the spiritual. It goes into the spiritual realm of that oneness that oneness and a spiritual oneness can only be found when the husband and the wife surrender to God and each other that's the only way it's going to be found you can't muster it up yourself you got to surrender to the Lord and you got to surrender to each other you got to have respect for each other you got to respect your wife, husband, and wife likewise. You got to respect your husband. And one thing, good thing, the relationship is not centered on me and my. It should be I mean, centered on us and ours. Us and ours. And when I say that, this is what I'm talking about. Separate bank accounts. Yep. Or, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, liberation. <laughs> okay, Chuck. You know, so, what I mean by that, let me tell you a little story about me and my wife. When we first started dating, you know, like Pastor Bob say, you know that you know that you know that you know. When I saw that woman, bam, I said, that's it, Lord. <laughs> that's it, you know. And she said the same thing, you know. But now everybody can't do this. I think, and I ain't putting me and her up there or anything like that because it was God. But when we first started dating, we opened up a bank account together. That was the level of trust that we had between each other. We opened up a bank account together. And from the day that we met each other to the day she left and went to be with the Lord, we had the same bank account. There was no my money, her money. It was ours. Everything we accumulated through God 
was ours. We were just stewards over it because it belonged to him. Everything belongs to him. The car we drive, the house we live in, the clothes on our back, it all belongs to the Lord. We just stewards and supposed to take care of it. Okay? So, ain't no me and ain't no mine. It's, it's, it's all ours and us. Making a marriage lasts for your lifetime. Both parties have to make that marriage a priority. It's got to be a priority. That marriage between the two of you, that's what keeps the family together, is you got kids. That marriage between the two of you, those kids are watching you. And those kids, in some kind of way, they're going to emulate you. Well, I saw mama do this. I saw daddy do this. It must be okay. You know, that just like if, if the father is fighting the wife in the house and the kid sees that, he takes on that personality. He'll grow up and do the same thing. So you have to watch what you do, you know, in a marriage, especially in front of your children. And another thing, don't talk about divorce. Don't talk about divorce. I don't care if you're mad at each other. Don't talk about divorce. Because when you start talking about divorce, you're still going against the word of God. Because God instituted marriage to be forever. As long as you got your earthly life, you're supposed to be married to that woman and that man forever. Well, not forever, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so people whose marriage lasts a long time, they celebrate their commitment to each other. We seen that right here between Miss Susan and Pastor Bob. They celebrate their commitment with each other all the time. Them people in love. They in love, yay. Yes. And in this body right here, that's our example. Now, there's good examples in here, but that's our main example. Because if you handle your marriage the way Pastor Bob and Miss Susan handle their marriage, you can't go wrong. That's our template. The Bible, you know, well, I heard Pastor Bob tell me this. He said, Willie, you follow me as long as I follow Christ. When I stop following Christ, you stop following me. So he's following Christ, she's following Christ. So if you married and thinking about getting married, follow them. Because they are a very good example of what marriage is supposed to be. This is our example in the body of Christ, Pastor Bob and Miss Susan. In fact, the purpose of the church is to spur one another toward love and good deeds. Don't they do that? Amen. They spur us to love one another. They spur us to good deeds. And that's what it's all about. That's what the church is for. We're supposed to spur each other toward love and toward good deeds. So in closing, It don't prize, surprise me at all that the uh, world desires to change what God has instituted when it comes to marriage. It don't surprise me at all. Even though the world is providing their own definition of what they call marriage, the Bible still stands. Amen. The Bible still stands. And the clear definition of marriage, to me, is the union of God, one man, one woman, for life.
Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we ask you right now in the name of Jesus that those that are married, that they will remember when they first met and the strong love that grew between them. And Father, we ask that they will work and love into practical things so nothing can divide them or their marriage, Father. We ask that they speak words of both kindness and love to each other and that their hearts are always ready to ask for forgiveness as well as to forgive. So Father, right now we place their marriages and their marriages that are to be into your hands today and forevermore. Amen.